So welcome to another Old Frontline podcast supporters evening, this time for January 2024. It seems kind of incredible that we're 10 years from the, the Great War centenary and 10 years on, um, here we are still talking about the Great War and uh, on all kinds of new platforms that, although they existed a decade ago, kind of Great War podcasts were not really that kind of um, mainstream, I don't think, during the centenary, which is probably a, a sad thing in some respects. Anyway, um, uh, we're kind of looking a bit further back tonight because we're going to have a look at some postcards of Ypres before, during and after the Great War. So I'm just going to share my screen and we will begin. So, so what we're going to do is have a look at um, some images. Now, you know, I'm sitting in my kind of archive room, which is uh, full of First World War photographs. Um, having spent so many years not just visiting the battlefields, but kind of collecting uh, around that interest in the battlefields, one of the things that I've never stop collecting and i'm still collecting to this day is imagery relating to the great war i mean there is a staggering amount of it out there and i have thousands of unpublished photographs from from this period which has been great using this kind of medium to share them with you in previous meetings and that's kind of what we're we're going to do here with this talk and eve of course was a greatly greatly photographed place uh, it stood, of course, in many respects for the British war effort during all four years. And by British, I mean British and Commonwealth, because it became a place bathed in the blood of not just from of men from, from Great Britain, but the wider of what was then the empire. Every kind of corner of the empire came to Ypres with kind of big hitters like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa. But by the end of the war, you know, men from the very far corners um, including the Indian Army, participating in some of the early battles of the conflict, but soldiers in the Indian Labour Corps being involved in some of the behind-the-line stuff later on, Fijian Labour Corps, and although China wasn't part of the British Empire, men of the Chinese Labour Corps also contributed to the British and Commonwealth war effort at Ypres during the war. So it was a place where you know, the kind of world collided with the war on the Western Front. And because of its close proximity to the Channel Ports, it became the biggest visited battlefield location in that interwar period, something we've talked to Professor Mark Connolly about on previous podcasts and discussed in the podcast itself and chatted about here as well when we've looked at the kind of aftermath period. And what we're going to do with this is kind of run through um, the kind of imagery of Ypres from that pre-war to post-war period. Now, I've had quite a few emails of late from people kind of inspired by different aspects of the podcast and a few from people who've just started collecting postcards and photographs of the of the first world war and although they're not quite as cheap as when i first used to pick them up way back in in the 80s when you could go to a postcard fair or a, or a junk market and there'd be boxes and boxes of postcards of what the the dealers called war damage which were photographs of destroyed places on the western front where they were typically like a penny each uh, or sometimes they kind of give you a load and charge you like just you know a few pence for these things they're a little bit more expensive now but eep is a really good if you're kind of thinking about well i'd love to collect postcards eep's quite a good kind of subject to to pick upon because there are so many images and hopefully you'll kind of get a sense of that um, during the course of this evening so let's move on if i can get the thing to move there we go so let's move on to our first image so eep was uh, a medieval city on the outbreak of the war in 1914 and this is typical of the kind of Ed, what we call the edwardian period postcard of eep showing the center the, the kind of beating heart of Ypres before the war. Now, Belgium was a country that had come into being post the Napoleonic Wars, post the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815 with the creation of the country of Belgium, the securing of its neutrality by a number of nations, including Great Britain with the Treaty of London. And it was a country made up principally of two ethnic groups. In the east centre part of Belgium were the Wallonians, the French speakers, and in the western part of Belgium uh, were the Flemish-speaking Flemish people who spoke a dialect essentially of Dutch, and uh, they lived in this area of Flanders. And although 
Ypres is is the French pronunciation, the French spelling for this city. That's what it was officially called at the time of the Great War because the French speakers dominated the country of Belgium in 1914. To be an officer in the Belgian army, for example, you had to be a French speaker. And there was a the, the kind of Flemish people were were kind of a bit under the heel, really, in terms of the way Belgium was governed and managed and, and kind of resources. And that wouldn't really rectify itself until after the, the Second World War with the identity of uh, Flemish people and their language being um, accepted as just as important as the Wallonians. So that's when Ypres eventually became Ypres, as we know it today. But it has been known by, I think, 20 different spellings of that name over the centuries. The further you go back into history, the more and more spellings that you find of it. So um, Ypres marked on the maps of 1914 with that French spelling and the map data used by British and Commonwealth forces. And that's how it became known as Ypres. And this is a typical postcard, I say, from what we call the Edwardian period. So this is probably around about 1910, the centre of Ypres, the main square with the market and the bandstand. And it's photographed by Anthony of Ypres, who was a local photographer who would be very active both at the beginning of the Great War and then after the Great War as well. And his archive survives. Uh, for a long time, it was very difficult to access, but it's now, I believe, in the archives of the In Flanders Fields Museum, and they have all of the images, and they've published some really kind of great uh, collections of those images in recent times, and, and they did a quite a good exhibition as well. So this is kind of the, the idyllic Ypres from the beginning, uh, or prior, just prior to the Great War. Oh, hang on a minute, I'm just going to get these. There's too many buttons on Zoom now. <laughs> Okay. Not it then, is it? Right. Okay. Oh, well, there we go. So this is a kind of uh, an, another local uh, photographer, uh, Calloayert of uh, of Eep. Um, he's a very common kind of photographer for this period. And also, again, he re-emerges post-war. And it's incredible for us to kind of look at this, thinking that this is the pre-war Eep. For those of us that have been to Eep and know Eep pretty well, it is kind of like looking in a mirror, really. The one difference being the cathedral in the background, which now has a much higher spire, which is you can always tell the difference between pre-war and post-war photographs because of that. And this shot kind of looking across the rooftops of pre-war Eep shows this little idyllic Flemish city described in a Baydecker's Guide as a medieval gem of Europe because of its predominance of medieval period buildings. It had a population of just under 17,000 when the war broke out, and I think there was something like nearly 2,500 buildings within the city walls. It had once been very prosperous because of the cloth trade. The big building in the middle there is the Cloth Hall, which was where there were stalls in which cloth was bought and sold in that medieval period, and the canal system around it was used to ship that cloth all over Europe. And it had gained wealth from the taxation of that trade, and it was still pretty wealthy in the approach to the Great War, but it was not quite the kind of economic superhighway in terms of trade that it had been once before. But in 1914, in those early battles of the Great War, in the race to the sea, it stood in the path of the German invader, and it ended up being one of these pivotal locations along the Western Front. So we go from this idyllic setting of medieval Ypres to the beginning of the destructions of its key buildings. And this is that cloth hall just after the first major bombardment struck the main tower and the building on the 22nd of November 1914 at the tail end of the first Battle of Ypres in 1914, and the building caught fire. There were it was a municipal building then, but it also had a lot of artwork in it and um, a lot of other artifacts that were subsequently lost. The civilian population, as we'll see in some of these pictures, remained in Ypres at this point. They remained in Ypres right up until the gas attack of April of 1915. Some people left, but the British had no power to make them leave at that point so um there were civilian casualties and they kind of I mean, what must it have been like you know for kind of people of Ypres to stand there and see their proud buildings 
uh, be destroyed like this. And of course, in some respects, it has a, a resonance with modern times with, I guess, in particular, what we're seeing in the Ukraine over the course of the last nearly two years now. Uh, so that's a postcard of the uh, the building after it caught fire and was badly damaged and scaffolded up. This is a private photograph taken with a vest pocket camera by a soldier in the Honourable Artillery Company, the HAC. It's from a little album I have of an HAC guy. They were a, um, a regiment that had a lot of kind of middle class and upper class guys in it who would eventually become officers. So people from kind of moneyed backgrounds or certainly uh, not necessarily super wealthy, but enough wealth to go out and buy a kind of decent camera. And there are one or two photographic collections relating to the HAC. Uh, this one I'm lucky to have. It shows kind of Ypres, I mean, late 14, early 15, and then the trenches around St. Loire and on the Messines Ridge. But this is a kind of British Tommy snapshot um, of the building, kind of showing the destruction that he saw as he passed through it. And with each passing month, of course, soldiers saw more and more destruction to this. Some years ago, when I was working with Dan Snow on a documentary, we were looking at his grandfather's diaries. And he was commanding a British division up in the front line during the Second Battle of Ypres near to Potesa. And he was uh, sit sitting one morning before the battle began. Uh, having a cup of tea on the balcony of the Chateau of Portes, a very kind of different experience to the men that he commanded who were up in the very front line, I suspect. But he was sitting there having his morning cup of tea when he saw a German 420 millimeter shell come out of the Hutals Forest where they had a gun battery there, uh, pass over the top of him like an express train and then hit the tower of the cloth hall and the whole sections of the building fell away. So as the bombardments continued at this stage, it was only long range guns that could fire into Eep. More and more damage uh, was suffered by the buildings within it. And uh, this is from a, an album which I'll return to that I have that I bought many years ago. I often talk about uh, the Sussex junk shops and all this kind of stuff. Well, one of the great places back then was Brighton Street Market. It was in a little kind of side street just down from uh, uh, Brighton Station. And there would be stalls and stalls and stalls of junk. And one morning I was going along. There. I hadn't found very much that morning. And I got right to the end of it, the end of the street. And sitting on a table was a, a, a photo album which had been torn apart. All the cover had been torn off. But all the pages were still there. And sitting on the very top of it was this image, which I instantly recognised as the cloth hall. Asked the guy how much he want for it, which was virtually nothing. And I didn't even bother to look at the other pictures. I thought, well, it's worth it just for that picture. Bought it and then took it away and sat in a cafe um, and was amazed to kind of see what was in there. And we'll see some more pictures. This was taken by an officer in the Army Service Corps sometime either in late 14. We can still see some of the scaffolding up or in early 1915. And we can again begin to see the kind of level of destruction that's taking place. Jumping on a little bit to part way through the war, this is the winter of 1916. And this is a postcard uh, taken from an aerial photograph looking down on the city of Ypres, covered in snow. It's an incredible photograph in many ways. And we can see the central square of Ypres, the ruins of the Cloth Horns, Martin's Cathedral. And we can see the Palace of Justice at the far end of the square is still in pretty good condition. And then what we call today Menenstraat, going up towards the, the Menin Gate, the gap in the ramparts ahead there. And this uh, was given to me some years ago, this postcard, by Anne Williamson who married Richard Williamson, who was one of the sons of the author Henry Williamson. And this was a postcard that Williamson had brought back from one of his many trips to Ypres in the interwar period. He served at Plug Street in 1914-15, but he never served at Ypres as such itself. So this is not one that he kind of picked up during the war, but one he picked up uh, in that interwar pilgrim period when a lot of these kind of postcards were on sale to battlefield visitors. But this is only halfway through the war, and we can see the kind of level of destruction already that the city of Ypres has got. And there's another two years of fighting nearly to go. And by the end of that conflict, you know, Ypres was just a ruin. And the next couple of pictures kind of give us a bit of an insight into that. This is what we are beginning to see with the city of Ypres come the end of the Great War. It's beginning to resemble like something like the, the ruins of an ancient civilization in, in many respects that the casual visitor who hadn't really understood what had happened here, I mean, I don't know how that would be possible during the, the years of 1418, but if they had just turned up, it, they might have thought it, it's some kind of preserved relic from an ancient age, these ruinous buildings 
sitting amongst rubble in a desolate landscape, what did it kind of symbolise? And that's an interesting question in its own right. And I think that the kind of level of imagery that we have showing these ruins is really important because that in itself is the symbolism. The, the destruction of this city, the terrible chaos wrought upon it by four years of war, and around it, of course, the sacrifice uh, and that the city holds fast, apart from a tiny point in 1914 when Germans entered uh, Ypres very briefly, it was in Allied hands for the whole four years of the war. Quarter of a million British and Empire dead had fallen in defence of it during those four years. And in many ways, it, it become the anvil of a British and Empire sacrifice in the Great War. It stood kind of for everything. And these ruins, I think, stood for the gallant defiance of Belgium and the defiance of British and Empire troops and alongside them, of course, Belgians and French, and by 1918, Americans as well, and many others, as we've said, uh, defending this ground. Holy ground is what they often refer to it as. And this is a kind of shot that was... Um, that's taken in what is today Botterstraat, looking down towards the main square um, with the corner of the cloth hall just up ahead there and St Martin's Cathedral round to the left. And then this one is taken in the main square, looking across towards the main building. And this is the kind of ruin estate that the cloth hall and the cathedral was in. And it was said that in 1918 that you could um, kind of canter into Epe on a horse and uh, there you were, kind of slightly elevated, being on the back of a horse, but you'd have pretty much an uninterrupted view from one side of the city to the other because there was barely a building tall enough to block your field of vision. That was the kind of level of destruction. Nothing really survived the Great War within the city of Ypres. Although these are standing buildings, I kind of say standing in a very loose sense, because in many respects, the rebuild of these meant that they had to pull them down and then start again. It wasn't possible really to renovate buildings that had been this badly destroyed. And although you can go around the city and find, particularly on the cloth hall, remnants of wartime period, brickwork that was reused and stonework that was reused, pretty much everything had to be torn down and rebuilt. And that's a kind of a, a very kind of basic uh, postcard. I'm not sure of the origin of those those ones. They're part of a series, uh, which I've I've found a few examples of those. But this is a professional photograph, one of two that I'm going to show you, showing the ruins of Ypres. People were, I think, when they came there in that immediate post-war period or at the end of the Great War, Great War, were fascinated by this structure because it is a very compelling structure. And they would have seen wartime images, perhaps of it in a better state. But there it was, this this ruin, and kind of everybody wanted to be part of it. And it's difficult to show on this screen, but there is a fence around those ruins for two reasons: one, to stop people wandering in there and bits bits of the stonework coming off and kind of coming down on top of them, but also to stop people stealing parts of it because there were people going in there and picking up this stone like it's some kind of holy relic now british tommies did that during the war i remember looking at some some documents in the national archives when it was the public records office many years ago about a case of i think two officers in the royal naval air service who were prosecuted by uh the town major of Ypres during the war for stealing um parts of the building to take away as relics now they must have been very unlucky because certainly over the years of collecting great war memorabilia i've seen lots and lots and lots of bits of eep come up for sale in auctions people take it with them on battlefield tours and in the old version of the what is now the in flanders fields museum but used to be the eep salient museum they used to have a special case in there of the latest bits of old eep that have been brought in by visitors who'd wanted to return them to the city. Fragments of clocks, fragments of the building, bits of plaster work, uh, bits of stained glass window, and you know, all that kind of stuff. But it is a greatly photographed structure, this, and you can see why. I think it kind of epitomises what the ruinous landscape of the Great War really looks like. And this is just around the corner from it, so we're very close to St Martin's Cathedral, which is to our right here. This is the archway of the kind of uh, outer buildings, uh, of the kind of religious settlement that was here long before the Great War. That structure was rebuilt. It's got battle damage on some bits of the stonework, if you look carefully. Um, so again, that was kind of torn down and then reconstructed. 
And in the background, you can see buildings in a ruinous state, some uh, awaiting repair and also wooden huts. And this is what was put up for the people of Ipu returned in 1919, couldn't live in these ruins because it was too dangerous. And this provisional housing, these huts were put up everywhere in the city to house them. It also included people that lived in the villages outside of Ipe, where there was nothing at all, no way of living there. And they, they could go up there during the day, try and reclaim their land, reclaim their buildings, look for their lost property, maybe. I mean, how they found that in the kind of moonscape of places like Langemark and Holkapel and Passchendaele, I don't really know. But then at night, they would then come back and they would sleep in Ypres and the old battlefields would be silent and quiet and empty and deserted. And again, Henry Williamson, who I mentioned, went to the battlefields at that time and spoke about them being this extraordinary landscape that was desolate and silent, devoid of, of humanity and, and a strange place to be where, to him, the battlefields were a place of the staccato fire of machine guns and flares and everything else. Um, so it was a kind of strange world even after the war. And um, going back to kind of people stealing parts of it, they had to put up notices to tell them not to do that. So in front of this, this is a postcard showing the ruins of St Martin's Cathedral, and in front of it is a notice that says, Notice, this is holy ground. No stone of this fabric may be taken away. It is a heritage for all civilised peoples signed by the town major of Ypres. So those kind of signs went up all over the place to stop people swiping stuff. I, I don't think that entirely succeeded uh, in that uh, in that respect. So, excuse me, I'll just move on to the next one. And so that, that sign moved around the corner eventually from the cathedral, or maybe it's a second sign. This is uh, from a little collection I've got to an Imperial War Graves Commission photographer who photographed places with his camera, graves. He was taking war graves photographs of families, but he used the camera to take kind of um, snapshots of the battlefields as well. And this is one of them showing the rubble of the cloth or part of one of the archways, one of the lions from the Menin Gate that had been moved in front of the cloth all at this stage. And again, that sign saying this is holy ground. And that became a kind of a mecca this particular spot, because again, it, it kind of looks the deal in terms of a ruinous structure on a smashed battlefield. There's the Lion of Ypres there, the Lion of Flanders, and it becomes heavily photographed. And people have, you know, I, I don't think they called them selfies in those days, but they kind of had selfies of shots taken of them standing in front of this thing. And this is from a, a series of... Uh, stereo cards that were produced by a British veteran who went over there with his son in the 20s and took a whole load of really fantastic images of the battlefields. I've never seen a full set of these to know exactly how many there are, but I've, I've probably got about 50 or 60 of them, and they came in little cardboard boxes and they've all got captions on the back. They seem to be pretty accurate with the, with the captions, um, and it kind of shows the same kind of thing. So this was a very, very heavily photographed part of the... Uh, uh, of the city um, at that time and it shows that the, the process of rebuilding was a long one this was not done in kind of five minutes but as we move into the 20s so this is taken on the 1st of august 1924 and with a, a kind of cheap little camera and it shows now the rubble is gradually being cleared away it's six years since the end of the great war and the reconstruction begins the tower has been dismantled and rebuilt scaffolding is up the work for the rebuilding of the cathedral is going on in the background. There's still some ruinous bits of this far end of the cloth hall. And we're beginning to see the development of this battlefield tourism uh, from the early 20s through to this mid and late 20s period when it was particularly active. We can see quite a decent vehicle in the middle of the square there, probably awaiting some battlefield visitors to go out onto the battlefields. Party of British visitors on the right. And there's a little kind of souvenir stand on the right hand side where you could buy trench art and you could buy um, um, uh, postcards and maps and all kinds of kind of memorabilia connected to the uh, to the battlefields. It was very much an industry, really, the kind of battlefield tourism already at this this kind of stage. And then we kind of move on into the 30s, and this is when the reconstruction work has really been kind of moved up a pace, and the city has risen like this phoenix from the ashes, but it's still not complete. The cathedral has now been done um, pre-war, as I mentioned, they'd hoped to 
have a taller spire one day, uh, sort of the stubby little spire that they had, and the reconstruction of the cathedral enabled them to, to do that. The cloth all wasn't finished. One end of it was almost finished by uh, the outbreak of the Great War, the, cent the, the Second Great War, rather, World War II. The central tower was done, but this end... Uh, of the Clothal was not finished until 1962. So it took until well after the Second World War for that entire building to be eventually finished. And here we can see even more battlefield tourism with cars, taxis in the main square waiting to take battlefield visitors, little Sharabang buses to take groups of people up onto the battlefields, even more souvenir stands, and then all the kind of tourism paraphernalia around it with uh, shops and cafes and and various other things and this shot taken in the main square looking down towards the Menin gate which you can see in the distance so this is obviously post 1927 shows a whole kind of cab rank of buses and taxis that are there for one reason only they're not there to take uh mrs de Coeur off to you know shopping to go and get her uh baguette or um uh or uh a Flanders stew in the local uh, cafe. They are there to take um, battlefield visitors out onto the battlefields. And by the 30s, something like a quarter of a million English-speaking people were visiting each year. It's staggering, staggering numbers. And it showed no kind of ebbing away as the approach to another war became and uh, began. And, and in this square, we can see there are so many different hotels. There were very few hotels, I think, in Ypres before the Great War, but the demand with visitors uh, resulted in more and more of these. And some of these are still here today. Les Al there. There used to be a very nice hotel called the Sultan uh, in this part of the square, which we used to use in the early days of our uh, Ledger battlefield tours, which had been used by pilgrims in the 20s and 30s. Um, so the kind of town rebuilt itself and, and re redesigned itself, uh, repurposed itself as, as this moving from a quiet medieval market town city to becoming the centre of battlefield tourism on the British and Commonwealth, British and Empire part of the Western Front. So we'll move away from the main square and we're over at the railway station now. This is a postcard uh, of the ruins of the railway station at the end of the, the First World War. It was an important station at the beginning of the war where troops were brought in. Uh, at that stage, it was largely a French part of the line. British troops were at different points around it, but the French utilised the railway line from Hazebrook to Popperinger, from Popperinger to Ypres, and unloaded troops and moved them up to the front line. By the end of the Second Battle of Ypres, when the Germans occupied all that high ground, uh, around the city that wasn't possible so Ypres station was abandoned and wasn't used again until the very end of the conflict and then immediately post-war for the arrival of uh, people coming down from Ostend or coming from the channel ports via Hazebrook to Popperinger when the line used to be open there and into Ypres um, so that's what it looked like at the end of the war and this uh, bear with me again uh, so this is the um, the album that I mentioned taken by a Army Service Corps officer who was part of one of the Indian divisions. So he was in the Indian Corps. And this album of about 300 photographs, he took covers France and Flanders and also Mesopotamia, uh, where he was for the last part of the of the war. And that's him. I don't know who he is. There's no captions at all to this, no names, no nothing. But I'm pretty sure that that's, he's the photographer. And that's him with his car. And being in the Army Service Corps with transport, you can have a fairly decent camera with him and he doesn't have to worry about carrying it every, anywhere. And he took a whole load of pictures of Ypres and the surroundings. This is one of his men standing on um, the railway station at Ypres. So this is the railway station at Ypres, um, standing on the platform. It's taken a bit of a heavy pounding. I would guess this is probably early 1915. And there's boxes of kit and so on in there, ammunition or supplies or whatever, um, which, of course, is the task of the Army Service Corps to move around. And this is um, another shot taken of the kind of same location on a slightly different angle. I mean, these private photographs like this in this early period of the war where there were no official photographers are really, really important and are what we really rely on for the kind of photographic record of the first two years of the war. And it wasn't really until the Battle of the Somme that people like Geoffrey Malins and uh, Baby Brooks uh, using um, cinematographers uh, like Malins and uh, photogra photographers like uh, Brooks to really kind of capture uh, the images prior to that you know our record is, is based around these kind of images and then he went on a kind of walkabouts up into the city 
this is probably one of the streets near the railway station, given where he was in the previous photographs, showing the level of destruction to the buildings. Our buildings were gutted by fire and had been damaged by artillery fire. Bearing in mind, this is 1915. We can kind of still see the resemblance of buildings, not quite flattened as they were later on, but still quite a lot of damage. And then uh, other parts were perhaps slightly away from the, uh, the kind of field artillery or heavy artillery shells would need big uh, pieces of artillery to bombard Buildings have had the fronts blown off. You know, these are kind of look more like shots of the of the World War II blitz and so on. But this building's been hit. Uh, the upper floor is collapsing. The beds are kind of sliding out from it. And whether that's grain or hops that's been up in the kind of loft area that's come down, um, or whether that is the kind of insulation that was used up in the lofts at that time, I'm not entirely sure. But it kind of shows a typical kind of scene in one of the side streets of Ypres during that period. And as I mentioned, there were civilians still living at Ypres. So this is a picture that he took while the front line was firmly established around the city, while the fighting was going on there. And here are some Belgian civilians living in Ypres, going about their kind of daily business amongst the rubble as if it's some kind of normality. I guess it was the new normality. It's how people adapt to these kind of uh, circumstances, given the... Um, the predicament and uh, and the circumstances that they're in. And then later on in that area, around the kind of um, railway square where he was uh, in 1915, because of its importance of a link to the outside world post-war and the arrival of um, uh, pilgrims via the station, that square in front of the railway station, I'm sure many of you have never really kind of looked around it, but it is a really important part of Ypres from a pilgrimage aftermath point of view, because that's where most visitors came in. There were a lot of hotels there. Uh, many years ago, uh, I stayed there with Tony Spagnoli, a great war author, and uh, Tony Shepard, who I mentioned in a recent podcast, who was the pilot that took John Giles um, over the battlefields. And we were there on a trip to, uh, Spaggers was unveiling a plaque to uh, the guys who'd been killed at Celtic Wood in 1917 in St George's Memorial Church and we stayed in one of the original hotels there which had been used and the Spaggers had a load of pictures of veterans in there in the 1920s and 30s. Sadly that hotel has been demolished it's in a very nice modern block of flats but that kind of bit of Eep history is lost. But this square also became a kind of repository of, of war booty uh, and relics. So this British tank that had once been up on the battlefield, I think this one came from near Polkapel had been dragged back into the city and put on display here. And there were some German field guns and howitzers uh, in this square as well, all of which disappeared in World War II uh, when the Germans took them off for scrap. So we're going to move away from the railway and we're going to go to the kind of ramparts and the two gates now, starting at Lillgate. And this is a, a pre-war picture from around about 1910 of the Lillgate. He, surrounded by these walls, had these four main gates to uh, the different locations uh, that the gates and the roads coming through them led to. Lille Gate on the road to Lille, Menin Gate on the road to Menin. Uh, there was a Dixmuda Gates as well, for example, on the other side of the city. But in most, by the time of the Great War, most of the ramparts had been removed and the section that remained went from the railway station via the Lille Gate round to just beyond the Menin gate you can still trace where the ramparts were in the modern city even today by looking for uh, the the moat section the continuation of the moat section but the actual traces of the walls themselves have long since disappeared and this is a very idyllic kind of image of what the gate looked like on on the eve of war and this is from the other side so this is taken from within the city looking through the little gates out towards uh, the front line, just de continuation of that road was during the war of taking you to Shrapnel Corner and the front lines up towards Zilla Beak and Hill 60 and the Bluff and various places like that. And we can see it's very nice kind of pubs. I think the, the wooden building on the right there, if I remember correctly, was one of the oldest buildings in Ypres at that time. That was pretty much restored, completely destroyed in the war, but it was restored. There's a kind of 1920s copy of that there now. And uh, the Klein Rissel um, pub there, the white building, uh, became a, a cafe again. And up until, well, I don't know, 10 years ago, um, it also had a very nice little kind of war museum um, in it as well. But again, a kind of idyllic image of what this part of the city looked like 
people kind of living there and the person who took this had no idea of the kind of fate that, that awaited it and the importance of this gate. In many respects, the Lord Gate was more important than the Menin Gate because the vast majority of troops that left the city went out or into the city through the Lille Gate rather than the Menin Gate, which was in direct observation by the Germans. So jumping on to the end of the war, uh, this is what the Lille Gate looked like. We can see complete devastation of the buildings that had once stood there. Uh, what we're seeing with the water in the kind of foreground of this is the old medieval sewers underneath this part of the city blown apart and exposed and flooded overgrown rubble on our right hand side and and then kind of wartime uh fabricated structures on the left which were part of the headquarters and this is part of the ramparts where it said Bloom are at his headquarters the tunnelers at their headquarters there were there was a, a dressing station close to here and one of the very first war museums was in that white um archway to the left of the gate we can see there uh, and that kind of remained open into the the twenties, from from what I gather. And this is a, this is a probably a slightly earlier shot uh, of the same place. You can see the kind of sewers exposed. They're all still there. They were rebuilt subsequently. And I remember a few years ago, I was in Eat when they kind of did a tour of these cellars, uh, of these tunnels, rather these sewers that you could go into and, and kind of have a look around. I mean, they're incredible pieces of medieval engineering that that brought fresh water into Eat and disposed of the sewage and uh, meant it was a very healthy place to live, which was why so many people wanted to live there and you'd have kind of a, a longevity living in a city with fresh water and good sewage that you might not have, you know, living somewhere else. This, of course, looked like, um, you know, something uh, even the people in the medieval times might have turned their nose up to the kind of state of, uh, of the city in, in, in this kind of uh, level of destruction. But it gives us an idea of how quickly in just a few years the bombardments turned a pretty kind of suburb of a city into a ruin and then this is um from a series of stereo cards that were made after the war from the other side of the little gate <clears throat> looking back in the moat bridge had been very badly damaged by artillery fire the sides of it rebuilt and the, the little kind of bridge balustrade bridge that went across the gate eventually had to be rebuilt as well uh, but we're kind of looking into the city and you, you can see already there's there's reconstruction going on in the background there there's some tin huts and so on but there's nothing like there the kind of was and the city is still uh, it hasn't got to that point where it's rising like this phoenix at that point it's still being uh the foundations are being rebuilt and they're deciding what to do with the civilian population that's returning there and of course close to the uh, little gate is the ramparts and this is the rampart cemetery this is a 1920s image uh, that is by Anthony of Ypres showing two veterans, British veterans that have gone back to lay some flowers on a comrade's grave. This the variations of this image appear in quite a few different postcards. It, it's a really moving photograph, I think, and it, it appeared in quite a lot of books and publications uh, of that interwar period. And it stood stood for for what these these men were trying to achieve when they went back on these battlefield visits in that interwar period. So we'll come back into the main square and we're back at the St. Martin's Cathedral. I have a, a few kind of photographs of that. Uh, although that says the Menin Gate E, but it's not <clears throat> it's not the Menin Gate. It's St. Martin's Cathedral. It's the main tower of it. But someone's written on there some of the lines from John McRae's In Flanders Fields. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. Um, and I guess that's something that a, a, a pilgrim during that interwar period wrote and brought back with them um, when they were there. Uh, just jumping back to the war, this is just outside the front entrance of the cathedral, the cathedral on the left, um, the cloth hall is on the right-hand side there. And this is, a, I think, a Belgian minister visiting the kind of ruins, seeing the destruction. It's an interesting photograph. It's a British Tommy kind of looking uh, at the party on the right-hand side there. This is in that kind of crossover period between it being an important part of the French defense of this ground in the background there are french soldiers um and it becoming a british sector but this is also the spot where later on this the cathedral was bombarded by heavy howitzers and men of the um uh, six battalion duke of corn was on infantry uh got um entombed some of them got entombed in in the actual uh, structure itself when he got hit and the, the roof came down and killed men and the divisional they were from the 14th light division i think the divisional pioneer battalion was a uh, battalion of the king's liverpool regiment the padre and some of the officers came out to try and rescue 
uh, some of the men who've been entombed in this rubble, not entirely successfully, lost casualties themselves. And the story became a famous one when it was written up in one of the Eat League books in that interwar period. And it kind of grew out of all proportion to almost an entire battalion being entombed uh, in the ruins of the cathedral and their bodies being found after the war. I mean, there were some, and those men are now buried in the Eat Reservoir Cemetery, not far from, from where this is on the other side of the uh, of the city. And this is a kind of photograph of that front entrance of the of the cathedral showing the level of destruction. Um, you know, this this proud medieval cathedral bombed to oblivion by four years of warfare, huge shell crater full of water in the middle there. On the opposite side of where this was um where this building stood, there were deep, deep cellars in, in many of the houses there. And it was an area that was used substantially by the British to shelter troops. Um, at uh, the during the daylight hours before they moved up to the front line, particularly in the early period of the war, and then the kind of garrison of support troops that operated within Ypres um, then used those same cellars to kind of shelter uh, later on in the war. And I guess these British Tommies who were kind of sitting in front of this, uh, probably this is from 1919, are either kind of just visiting or maybe they're using the same cellars to, to keep there before they move on. Uh, but I wanted to point out a couple of other kind of important buildings in Ypres that appear in postcards of this period. This is the prison. And uh, this was a very important building uh, from the British perspective because this was the headquarters of the town major of Ypres. He was the officer commanding Ypres. It wasn't the same man throughout the war. There were a number of town majors. And, but this was where his headquarters was located. It had very, very thick walls. The prison walls protected it as well. And it's, as you see, it's, under, it's taken some pretty hefty damage during those four years of the war, but it's not been levelled. And at the back of it, in the prison building, there was a dressing station, and that's where the what was called the Eep Prison Cemetery began, which was renamed the Eep Reservoir Cemetery after the war uh, for men who died of their wounds in the prison or been killed in Ypres uh, and then brought into that cemetery uh, for burial. So the prison was a very important building, um, not a kind of place you'd want to hang around outside now taking photographs. Um, he says, speaking from personal experience, but um, this is on the outskirts of Ypres on the Vlamertinger Road. This is coming into Ypres and this is the Lunatic Asylum. And the sign indicating you're coming up to the Eep city boundaries. Again, this was another really important building because there was another dressing station here. And there was a cemetery here called the Asylum Cemetery. And it's interesting that the, the commission, when they created permanent cemeteries, thought about the, the feelings of relatives who were of men who were buried in these kind of places because they changed the name of the prison cemetery to the reservoir cemetery so that people didn't think that their loved ones had died in a prison even though they may well have done but not as prisoners of course and here they decided not to change the name of the cemetery but close it and moving into another cemetery so that the families didn't think that their relatives had died in a lunatic asylum this was completely restored the building looks almost identical. I mean, not in the ruinous state, but the kind of original state. And this was on the main route into Ypres. And a few years ago, a building on the right-hand side, a big panelled bit of signage um, indicating the headquarters of the British Legion in Ypres was uncovered underneath some old tiles and has been fully restored, um, which was the kind of signal to pilgrims coming in on this road this is where you need to go to to get your battlefield tour information to make your visits out on that sacred ground around the city and another key building within the city was this this was the infantry barracks within Ypres now it's a garrison city it would have had its own military garrison of Belgian troops before the First World War who would have marched off, no doubt, to take part in the fighting along the Isa in 1914 and probably remained on that front for the rest of the war. But when the British came, they took this over. They used this as a as a barracks, as a place for units that were billeted within Ypres to rest in very, very thick walls. And also another dressing station was established here. The um, A lot of the casualties from the early period of 1914 and 15, when the front line was established and when the British sector at that time moved from east of Ypres to the southern part of Ypres, began at saint Loire and went all the way down into northern France at uh, La Basse. But in the, the southern Belgian sector, so from saint Loire down towards the Messines Ridge, a lot of casualties coming back to be treated in Ypres were brought to the dressing station here at the infantry barracks. And there was a separate cemetery here as well, 
and those graves were moved after the war. And that's the state of the infantry barracks come the end of the conflict. You can see a lot of sandbag sections, reinforced sections where the British have used this quite substantially. There are some very, very famous photographs of Australians here during the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917, for example, as well as these many. I mean, there are a lot of kind of postcard uh, photographs of this building as well. And it was never rebuilt. There is a kind of a a poor poor man's copy of it um, that's tucked away in the side street, not far from the Rampart Cemetery or the Little Gate, but it, it looks nothing like this. And, and it kind of hides really the importance of this building. It's mentioned in so many accounts of the Great War, so many war diaries and official documents. It's a it's a really important uh, building. There should kind of really be some kind of trail looking at all these in Ypres. I mean, Ypres has done so much, you know, far more than probably almost any other British and Commonwealth battlefield of the Great War. But I kind of feel a bit greedy and think that we should perhaps something have something like this to kind of show people how important some of these buildings um, were and where they were as well, because uh, it's hard to find. So we're going to come on to the ramparts now. Um, and this is one of the Kazamatan, one of the casemates uh, that are along the uh, the ramparts where powder would have been kept and uh, our weaponry when this was a medieval and then later Valban fort. And um, this uh, is an area now that is a, a brewery. Uh, the Eep Times beer is brewed here. Uh, if any of you are coming on the kind of podcast uh, supporters trip that we're doing in March to Eep, this is we're going to have a tour of this. Um, and those same kind of shaped windows, if you like, are still there to this day. And you're in a kind of section of the um, the ramparts where the Eep, uh, the Wipers Times um, newspaper was uh, was published uh, during the uh, the First World War. So um, it, the ramparts were cru cru crucially important during the war because they had these casemates within them, they had tunnels within them, and the walls were so thick that not even the German 420s were seemed capable of kind of destroying it. And really, they were the only feature of Ypres that truly survived the war. And this is a shot taken on the outskirts, looking over towards uh, bits of the ramparts. And we can see one of the infantry bridges that was constructed across the moat to get men from the ramparts area uh, out to uh, uh, to the battlefield area. There were lots of these um, bridges constructed. One, if you go across the modern bridge, across the moat, uh, that takes you through one of the sally ports of the of the ramparts that's pretty much on the site of a british bridge that was there during most of the uh, of the first world war and then inevitably we're coming round to uh, uh, to the menin gates and this is another one of these kind of idyllic images showing the menin gates sometime in those early 1910s with children playing in the street little kid coming up on his bike there's the lions that are now in australia that was so uh, kindly lent to Eep during the centenary period, and the copies are um, kind of this end of the uh, of the gate uh, now. Uh, the white building on the left hand side in the bushes is a pub, um, and with the civilian population living in Eep, it remained open as a pub uh, until it was hit by artillery fire, and the building was destroyed, and quite a few people were killed and entombed in the rubble, and their bodies were not found until the construction of the Menin Gate Memorial post war. And if you move on to the war itself, the pub has been blown away. Uh, that lovely kind of neat little causeway is now uh, a place of hell. There's a staff car driving through there. There's a sandbag emplacement, massive dinks uh, in the wall um, and ruinous buildings of the city of Ypres um, in the background. And then we jump on to the end of the conflict. And this is uh, one of a I kind of showed some pictures of the cloth hall and uh and the main square from this same series again i don't know who took this one but this is a real photographic image showing trucks coming up through the city uh, the british constructed in the latter part of the war a light railway system that ran across the moat bridge at the menin gate through the menin gate and into the city with a um a little side uh track that took them around the back of the square over towards the railway station and that seemed to have continued to be used uh, well into the 20s when it was uh, eventually dismantled. So I would guess this image is probably from about 1919. And then jumping on a bit to about 1920, uh, this is from a collection I got from a guy who went back, an officer who went back in the early 20s and took about 100 photographs of the, the battlefields as they were at that stage, looking through the Menin Gates, a couple of water bowsers there, 
towards the cloth hall and that's kind of zoom in on that image for you uh where we can see the ruins of the cloth hall in the di distance the light railway is gone now um so that kind of helps date it but still the city is this kind of um you know this this ruin ancient civilization ruin of an ancient civilization and the cross you can see on there is the junction of where the light railway went off to the left uh through the back of uh, the, the ruinous buildings there through right through the middle of where the Novotel hotel is now or near to that and then went right around the back of those buildings around the back of the square um out towards the lill street and beyond and this is from a, an album I have of a, an officer that ran a training centre during the Great War. He then went, obviously sent a load of guys up to the front line and thought when it was over, I'm going to go back and kind of find out where I was sending them. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a faded image, this one, but this is a, a horse and cart coming through the Menin Gate. We can see some of those battle dings on the wall on the right hand side there, battle splash, as I call it. Uh, I believe um, James Holland calls it Spang. Uh, but, um, you know, we've all got names for these things. Um, uh, we can see the kind of town gradually being rebuilt um, and the emergence of it being a place where civilians went about their kind of normal life. But of course, this was about to be selected for the site of the most important memorial to be built in Flanders during that period, which is, of course, the Menin Gate. Uh, just before we get to that, this is the same photographer taking a shot, I think a little bit later, looking back from the site of the Menin Gate across the Moat Bridge out towards um, the men in road uh, and some of the buildings that were being rebuilt in that area at that time, the one on the corner there, uh, still there now. And that top floor of that building was used extensively by photographers in the post-war, interwar period to take shots looking down at the Meningate Memorial. And here is the Meningate Memorial itself. Not long after the construction was pretty much finished, we can see there's some residual work going on on the right-hand side there. Uh, they're still kind of doing the groundwork around it itself. Uh, but I suspect this is quite close to 1927, this particular image. Uh, it's not done by a local photographer. It's on a British postcard. So whether this was someone who took a camera and then had these printed up, I don't know. But it's it's quite a, an interesting image um, taken from that kind of angle. Uh, but this is the more common shot that we see at the Menin Gate. This is probably kind of late 20s, early 30s. Again, it became a place not just of pilgrimage. We can see the, the wreaths piled up in front of the pillars of the gate there, but also a place where you got picked up on your battlefield tour and taken off into the frontline area. And I read an account of um, Italian ice cream salesman at uh, the Menin Gate some years ago, and I kind of thought, I'm sure that can't be right, can it? And, and lo and behold, in the foreground on the right-hand side, of this image where it says the British armies, there is an Italian ice cream salesman there selling ice cream. So, you know, we kind of go on about um, Tommy helmet shaped chocolates and, you know, kind of chocolates of the Menin Gate. But, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, they were selling a Menin Gate ice cream there. So I suppose nothing changes in, in that kind of respect. And then just to end with kind of the symmetry of it, you know, there's there's a city gone from being a medieval gem of Europe destroyed by four years of war, rising like this phoenix from the ashes to a point where it's been rebuilt and people can go about their lives. It becomes a centre of pilgrimage. And then a generation later, you know, just over two decades later, another war breaks out. There's fighting at Ypres in 1940. The Menin Gate is damaged and then it's not liberated for another four years. And this photograph is from a little collection that I picked up from an air craftsman in the Second Tactical Air Force, who served with Second TAF from 1944 to 45, and he took this as his convoy was driving through Eep, uh, through the Menin Gate, up to take part in Operation Market Garden in September of 1944, as they moved Tactical Air Force units nearer to the battlefield um, area. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, a phrase that we've used in the podcast before. This is where World War One meets World War Two, or maybe it's vice versa. But I hope that's kind of given you a kind of a bit of an insight of the kind of images that you can get connected to EEP. And they can, they're not just kind of objects that connect us to the story, but they can help tell the story as well. I think, you know, images are so important. I mean, I look back on all those boxes and boxes of war damage postcards that were a penny and dealers couldn't you know wait to get rid of them uh, they were really important historical documents and they remain so and I, and I think that they give us this vital and important insight into 
the fate of a city through just a few short years of the 20th century as it went from something to nothing and then kind of rebuilt itself only to see war cross its path again just a few short years later. So there we are. So I hope you've kind of found that uh, out of interest. So I'm just going to stop sharing there. Cool. I'm just going to have a quick slug of water. And what we'll do, the usual thing, um, I'm just going to stop recording there, actually, because just so we can um, kind of do questions and so on. Uh, so that bit can be uh, watched again by those who couldn't make it tonight.